the dog pound. These days we know it as the general term for Browns fans. It's a marketing slogan similar to Seattle's 12th man or Green Bay's cheese heads. But the dog pound is not some kind of marketing creation that was whipped up in some dude's office. No, the dog pound is something far, far more organic than that. It's much more than just the east end zone of Cleveland Brown Stadium. It's a organic creation between fans and a team that shaped NFL fan culture for years to come. So if you ever wondered how a team named after Paul Brown has a dog as their mascot, it's a story that shows how interwoven the Cleveland Browns are to the city of Cleveland, how a team and a city became whole. So this week on Worst Take, we're going to take a deep dive into the real history of the dog pound. The real dog pound. See, the dog pound today is not what it was when it first started. Today, the dog pound is more about marketing. And sure, while fans in that section have a tendency to get wild, it's just not the same in the new stadium. Dog pound tickets are now some of the most expensive to attain, and it's less about being rowdy and more about what kind of crazy brown and orange outfit you can bring to the game. And that's no knock to the dog pound. That's just what it has to be to exist in the modern NFL today. And by most other team standards, the dog pound is still a crazy place. But as you'll learn today, what the dog pound is now is considerably more tame than what the dog pound used to be. So while the east end zone of First Energy Stadium is technically the dog pound, and while the fans that sit in the dog pound are a thousand percent true diehards, because where else other than diehard Cleveland Browns fans will you find like three Kevin Johnson jerseys from 2001? But it's not the same and even they'd admit it. The dog pound today is a cleaned up, polished, and gentrified rebrand of itself. It's branded on team apparel. It's the hashtag used by the team's official Twitter account. The team has a fake dog mascot and two actual dog mascots. Today, the dog pound is a brand meant for everybody to enjoy. But the true dog pound was for the wildest and craziest degenerates that cheap beer could find. And see, at the time, they were looked at as degenerates. But today, they're pioneers. The original dog pound was no place for a civilized, family-friendly, and sober individual. It was a place for the degenerates who loved the Cleveland Browns. Whenever I'm outside of Cleveland and I tell somebody I'm a Browns fan, I'm always asked, why? And see, that's a question I'm never prepared to answer because I've never truly thought about it. As far as I know, I was born in Cleveland, my dad was a Browns fan, boom, I'm a Browns fan. That's as far as the logic has went and I have never questioned it or thought about doing anything else. And while that may seem like an odd concept, but if you grew up in the city of Cleveland, you will know that the Browns and the city of Cleveland have a connection that's deeper than football, it's deeper than wins and losses. The city of Cleveland is not beautiful by any architectural standards. The city is overrun by abandoned double-decker houses and old warehouses. To any outsider, the city of Cleveland looks like what would happen if you shrunk down parts of New York and dropped it in the middle of Detroit. Similar to that, the Browns colors and jerseys have never been considered high fashion. But to a Browns fan, to a Cleveland native, there's just something elegant and beautiful about that classic brown on white combination. There's something so nostalgic and heartwarming even to a young fan about the brown on orange jersey combination. A combination that most other people look at and criticize and make jokes about how ugly it looks. I look at that jersey combination with pride and I'm excited that they finally brought it back. And while many other teams try to do cool and trendy stuff with their helmets, Browns fans would burn down Berea if they even thought to do anything to those helmets, let alone slap a logo on. But see, all of this adds to the love affair that this city has with this team. Sure, 
to outsiders. The jerseys are ugly. The helmets are plain. The weather sucks. The team sucks. But there is an underdog quality to Cleveland that is just unique. And it's been developed through years of having to hear bad jokes about how awful the city of Cleveland is to somebody or how awful our sports teams are. So the city of Cleveland has a huge us against the world mentality. It's a city that celebrates its role players more than its stars. It's a city that if you embrace, will love you unconditionally. Most importantly, it's a city that's been through adversity and economic struggle. It's a blue collar town with the East Coast attitude. It's a place that won't take disrespect lightly and is not afraid to get ugly about it. And what the original dog town was, was that in a nutshell. A place that is safe, a place that is friendly for those who embrace what the dog pound is. But for outsiders, it's an absolute danger. The Dog Pound's origin is a perfect example of a fan base's connection with the players on the team. This all started when Hanford Dixon and Frank Menefield, the Browns' two best defensive players at the time, were trying to create an identity for the Browns' defense. And that's when they had this thought. We had an idea of the quarterback being the cat and the defensive line being the dog, Dixon said. Whenever the defense would get a regular sack or coverage sack, the defensive lineman would bark. And during training camp that year, Browns fans started to pick up on the barking and then started to bark themselves along with the team. And the defense started to call themselves the dog defense and local grocery stores had put up posters with the defense's four best players and four leash dogs with the caption, the dogs of defense in anticipation for the upcoming season. And this is where there was a perfect storm of elements to create the cultural phenomenon that is the dog pound. First, it was 1985. And at that time, there was way more hope than in years past because the team was able to select Bernie Kozar in the supplemental draft. This was important for two reasons. One, Bernie would eventually become a franchise quarterback. Two, Bernie was also a hometown guy who grew up being a Browns fan, who actively lobbied his way onto the Browns and not just lobbied, manipulated his way to the Browns. And as I said earlier, anybody who embraces Cleveland is loved by this city unconditionally. Imagine what that is for somebody who embraces the city, plays quarterback for the Browns, and is a Northeast Ohio native. The love was just something different. <laughs> Second, Municipal Stadium. See, Cleveland Municipal Stadium is a stadium both beloved and notorious for how terrible a facility it was. Built in an extremely odd way, these days it's not normal to see a hybrid baseball and football stadium, but in the 80s it was more of a norm. And due to it being a combo stadium and football kind of being the afterthought in that creation, it led to football stadium seats being kind of weird. A lot of bad angles, a lot of obstructed views, which led to certain oddities. Oddities like the closest seats to the field the bleacher on the east end being the cheapest tickets in the house. The third thing was that it was a pre 9-11 era and pre 9-11 stadium policies must have been way, way more lax than what we're used to now. See, while today something as simple as trying to sneak a beer into a football stadium is a task on par with trying to break into Fort Knox. Back then, much easier to just bring things into the stadium because things like TVs, dog houses, dog food, actual bones, leftovers, um, were regularly taken into a stadium. And if you don't believe that these policies are lax, look, this guy brought a saw into the stadium like it was nothing. A saw. Last year, they confiscated the bottle opener on my keychain. This dude brought a saw into the stadium. But since it was a more lax environment, it wasn't just easy to bring projectiles into the stadium. But remember those dog houses I mentioned earlier? Yeah, so according to like all accounts of people who were regulars in the dog pound during that crazy era, 
it wasn't a rare occurrence for somebody to sneak in a keg or two into the dog pound on any given Sunday. So now let's put all this together. You have an exciting fan base ready to support their homegrown guy at quarterback who's actually has a chance of being a franchise guy. Then you have the cheapest ticket available also be the ones that are just a few feet from the end zone. And finally, not only are you already plastered from tailgating, but now some dude comes by and offers you free beer out of this totally non-shady looking keg he snuck in through a dog house. And he hands you a few dog bones, a couple batteries, things that are very easy to throw at these players who are like maybe 10 yards away from you. Now just put that all together and imagine the kind of environment that would create. It created one of the most hostile and technically dangerous environments in all of pro football. Hanford Dixon once said, boy, did they intimidate the opposing teams. Teams didn't want to come in here. They didn't want to play and they wanted no part of that section of the field no part of it and that's no joke the dog pound was such a hectic environment had such a crazy presence that on more than one occasion it changed the outcome of a game in the fourth quarter of a 1989 game against the very hated denver broncos you gotta remember this is after the fumble and after the drive the broncos are not friends to the browns especially in 1989. The Broncos got rained with batteries, rocks, eggs, and other debris coming down from the dog pound, generally endangering the safety of those players. In order to create a safe environment for football to be played in, the referees had to do the smart decision and switch the ends of the field for the teams. But this put the wind at the Browns' back, and the Browns ended up winning the game off a field goal that barely crossed the crossbar because they had to win at their back, which they wouldn't have if those fans weren't throwing batteries. Now, this is no encouragement for Browns fans this year to get some D batteries and throw them at Ben Roethlisberger in order to get the win at her back. It's not something we need, but it is a story that needs to be told because could you imagine if that happened in today's modern NFL? I mean, it'd be crazy. But see, in the dog pound's height, things like this just happened regularly. But eventually it got to a point to where it needed to be reined in and the team had to ban fans from bringing in dog bones, generally anything dog related that could be thrown easily because it started to become a regular occurrence that opposing teams would just get pelted with just dog shaped items which is just crazy to think about especially with modern sensibilities because nowadays we look at something like bottle gate as just one of the craziest things to ever happen in an nfl stadium well in a dog pound's height it was bottle gate every sunday the dog pound had a huge impact on how nfl fans and teams brand their diehards today. The dog pound created the ideal of the ultra rowdy end zone section in the NFL. Before there was a black hole, there was a dog pound. Before there was a 12th man, there was a dog pound. Before there was the Lambo leap, there was jumping in to the dog pound. Much of today's NFL branding and culture comes from what those degenerates in the east end zone of Cleveland Municipal Stadium started in a very drunken haze. Does a city embrace wearing ski mask and dog mask if 30 years before Browns fans aren't getting drunk in the muni lot eating dog biscuits to support their team while viciously barking at the opposing team? The world may never know. Today, a lot of the fan culture is watered down and more mainstream for a wider audience. And the dog pound is not immune to that. Now for better or worse, probably for better, instead of throwing dog bones and sneaking in kegs, we hold up a flag that says dog pound. Instead of being just feet away from the end zone, which is a chain link fence, separating rowdy fans from an opposing team it's just a regular old end zone that you would see in any other stadium with some dog pound branding on the side of it. The dog pound is not the meeting place of those crazy, drunk, 
young degenerates that could barely afford to get into the game and bought the cheapest ticket in the house and just didn't give a damn. Now it's home to one of the most expensive tickets in the stadium. And while yes, everything about First Energy Stadium technically is much better than Cleveland Municipal Stadium, there's a reason why even when that's the case, there are still a lot of fans who have fond memories of Municipal Stadium because what Municipal Stadium had in spades was character. When I first went to First Energy Stadium, I had to be shown where the dog pound is. I imagine in Cleveland Municipal Stadium, there was no mistake where the dog pound was because you could tell where the dog pound was. Things are just different now. The NFL is more homogenized, it's more family friendly. But despite that, I think what fans miss about the old dog pound and the old stadium is the character of it all. The craziness, the wildness, sure it wasn't the best thing to do, and sure it's probably not something that should continue on today, but it sure as hell was something to talk about. Yes, while the dog pound that we knew is dead and now a memory to be reminisced, it doesn't mean that the spirit of the dog pound has died. See, when the team left in 95 and became the Ravens, there's a reason why the city fought so hard to keep the team name, colors, and history. Because the Browns name just means so much more to Cleveland than it would anywhere else. See, the city sees itself in those colors and that logoless helmet. There's a connection with the city and the team's history that's just rare for NFL fan bases to have. Could you imagine cheering for a football team that plays in Cleveland, not named the Browns? Not wearing a brown and orange helmet? Having a logo on the helmet? It just wouldn't have been the same. And if that had happened, the dog pound would have truly died forever. But see, they kept those ugly colors, they kept that logoless helmet, and they kept that history. But as long as those colors are ugly, as long as that helmet is logoless, and as long as that stadium sits on the shore of Lake Erie, the dog pound is alive in all of us because the dog pound is us all right guys that's gonna be it for this video and let me know in the comment section down below if you are somebody who experienced the dog pound as it was give me your best dog pound stories um and also i want to hear from those of you who experienced the dog pound who weren't browns fans but if you are a stiller fan who dared to experience the dog pound in the 80s or 90s leave your experience down below i think it'd be of great interest for a lot of people but if you liked what I said, if you like this video, if you like what I do here, please hit that like button, hit that subscribe button and ding the notification bell so you can be notified every time I upload. And if you have a buck or two to spare and want to help this show continue forward, please consider giving a buck or two a month to my Patreon so you can have your name on the bottom of this video as this nice scrolling bar goes past me. And if you like this nice little dogs gotta eat shirt that I got on, consider going to homage.com and getting yourself some of the most unique football apparel in sports. So you can show off to all of your friends when training camp kicks off because it's coming up soon. And you can save some money if you use the promo code worst take. And if you use the link that's in the description down below, check it out. But that is it guys. Thank you for watching. Have a great day. Have a good night.